really in the dark and I can't even figure out why. <clears throat> uh oh, I don't know what I did. Okay, try not to go on there. Okay, I'm gonna try to share this. Give me one second while I share it and then I will, um, then we can start. Okay, so I got new categories for y'all today. You can add a game? Yeah, same <laughs> like I did before. Well, it's a little bit different. Okay. But I don't know why it's taking me so long to get this shared. Okay, so this is how we're going to um, do the game today. Because it, it, I realize it doesn't work so well if y'all are talking over each other. So category of black love. I'm going to give you a category. You have to name five things in that category. The first person that starts answering, that's the person that gets to go. And those five things in that category, you have to be able to just say the things. No souls, ums, eyes, no filler words. Just answer the five things in the category, okay? okay. You got it? <laughs> okay, question mark. Pop quiz, <laughs> man. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I'm with Esty. I need to just, like... <laughs> I turn my camera off for a minute. I know, right? Come back. I know when the game is over. <laughs> Not when my the game is over. Then... Okay. So here's the category. So our category today, wait a minute, why is my um... true? True. <laughs> D. All of the above. All of the above. That's what I'm <laughs> Our category is five desserts that you would see at black grandma or auntie's house. Five Bana girl. banana yeah, pudding, yeah, banana yeah. pudding, <laughs> what? What <is> <laughs> red velvet cake, pecan pie, sweet potato uh, fluff, sweet <laughs> cobbler, <laughs> apple cobbler, um, gingerbread, yeah, bread yeah, pudding, red velvet cake. <laughs> Apple yeah, pie, right. apple pie, blackberry cobbler. Uh, oh, seven up cake, pineapple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seven up cake. <laughs> pineapple. I won. Upside down cake. Yeah, I think yes, they won. Pineapple pie was my grandmother's specialty. Pineapple pie. Pineapple. pineapple. Pie. Everybody says that, and I loved it so much. My that was my yeah, grandma's you, specialty. You, you and my mom. Out. Here's one that's know. not on the Black Love Soul Food list. My mom liked to make Italian cream cake. Oh, my really? mom did too. She did. Okay, so we're not. I'm not alone. I've yeah. never heard of yeah. that. I never yeah, heard. It was so good. Yeah. But y'all both yeah. from Alabama, right? My mama is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I've, ne I've never heard about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what's the pineapple pie? You gotta tell me about that one. So it looked. It it was like a double crust pie with canned pineapple and a lot of sugar and butter. It was so good. Mm. Yeah, you can't go wrong with sugar and butter. Nope. <laughs> never. <laughs> Crust? What about crust. Crust? Okay. Crust? Yes. <laughs> what about you, Esty? Was that similar to what you ate? No, we what I was saying is the Italian cream cheese of uh, the yeah. Italian cream cake. Uh -huh. But my mother liked to bake. So my mother did a lot of baking. And so that was probably the family least favorite outside of the house. But in our house, we liked it a lot. But my 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 daddy's folks were from Georgia, so like taking that to the to my grandma house on Sunday after church, it wasn't a hit. But <laughs> <laughs> but everything else, you know, my mother made fruit cake and uh, uh, pound cakes and pound cake with the lemon icing, uh, lemon meringue pie, you know, all that kind of stuff were her things. My grandmother was more the regular pound cake, uh, sweet potato pie, uh, pineapple upside down cake, seven up mm. cake, that kind of stuff. What were your grandmothers known for? Oh, wow. Like, what was the thing that when your grandmother showed up, everybody was, like, looking for? Sweet potato pie. Yeah, mm -hmm. sweet potato pie and all sorts of desserts, really. Yeah. Sweet My grandmother pie. wasn't known for anything but holding the dinner, and everybody else would come, and they each could do something. So she became famous more so because other people can cook. Then she could cook. So she only cooked for like us, like her grandkids. She would not cook for outside people. It was still good, but she didn't. She didn't do it. Sweet potato pie was my paternal grandmother, but my maternal grandmother, she was a potato salad. 
Oh yeah. Potato salad and caramel cake, chocolate Ooh, caramel cake, cake and pound cake. Yeah. My grandmother, it was the white cake, you know, the white cake with the pineapple in the middle and then oh. the white frosting with the coconut on top. Oh, yeah, coconut cake. Yeah, coconut cake. Oh, yeah. I the coconut off because I didn't like the coconut. <laughs> you know, I, I ate so much better. coconut cake growing up. I can't stomach it now because it was that was mm. one of the staples that was always there after Sunday dinner. You know, everything else was a coconut cake. I can't. I just can't with it now. It was like coconut that with me with caramel cake. <laughs> yeah. No, coconut makes yeah, everything hi. better. I like coconut cake. That was an Easter specialty, I think, in our house. Yeah. I liked um, coconut um, custard pie. I like <laughs> German chocolate cake because it had coconut in it. <laughs> Nobody said pecan pie. No, I said pecan pie. Oh, oh okay. Me no. over um, some other people. We're very excited about their desserts, but yeah, the pecan pie. <laughs> if my family only one auntie could make the pecan pie, or we weren't gonna eat it. So we had a know. my grandmother had a pecan tree in her yard, so it yeah, was like, yeah, everybody had take the tree, get, you know. So that was it. Easy. The nuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my great aunt had the pecan tree, and my cousin and I discussed that. Um, it, but I, I both of us agreed pecan pie wasn't our favorite, and I don't know if it's because we were on pecan duty in that backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's what it is. Pecan duty was rough. Pecan it was. Duty. And shucking uh shell and peas and shucking oh. corn, those three, I ain't gotta ever do yeah. neither one of those again. Yeah. It's 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 not mine. What was the thing that was always at a family dinner that you couldn't stand as a child, but it was always there? Black eyed peas. Oh. No, they were so good. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't stand candy. I, I don't eat candy mm -hmm. yams to this day. I eat sweet but, potato pie. Don't look at me like candy that. sweet yeah. potatoes. It's not uh, yams. Candy sweet potatoes. Candy right. sweet potatoes. Right. Right. That's not yams. <laughs> It's not yams yet. There's, those are not true yams. Yes. So I liked black eyed peas. I like candied sweet potatoes. But y'all, I know this is going to sound weird, but I did not like the barbecue sauce. I liked the barbecue, but I would ask, could I have mine without sauce? Because I did not like our, okay, if anybody from my hometown is watching, please don't hold this against <laughs> me. But I did not like our recipe for barbecue sauce. When I went out into the world and discovered there were other recipes, I was like, I like mine a lot sweeter and a lot spicier. Yeah. But I didn't like ours. And so I would not, I would ask for it without the barbecue sauce. But I didn't get to tell my grandmother specialties. My, gra my pater paternal grandmother was known for everything. She was known as a cook. She was a cook. She took a lot of pride and time with all of her dishes. And they were all Southern fare, uh, as far as I remember. But my maternal mother, grandmother, interestingly, did not, she she said she wasn't a big cook. So she wasn't known as the, the cook in the family. But you said what was they remembered for? And I thought of memory in two ways. Mm -hmm. So the larger family, but then my family, my I guess you could say nuclear family, my children cannot stop talking about their grandmother's cooking. Mm -hmm. And the last thing they discuss, and I think it's the one that we all love, is her homemade chicken pot pie. Oh. And they say, you never had real food until Grand makes you a homemade chicken pot pie. And she's going to make it like, Ugh. I have to make this for you because you have to eat it. Ah, but it's so good. <laughs> it is so good. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, wow. I mean, so on my grandmother's side, I already said on my mother's side, it was the coconut cake. On my father's side, my grandmother cooked chicken. Like both of my grandmothers were cooks, cooked like they. I thought I grew up thinking black, all black people, black women could cook because they could throw down. And so my paternal grandmother, she made, she always fried chicken, but she fried chicken in the oven. Oh, my mm. mom does that. She does. I mean, it was so good and so tender. So it would have the crust. It, it wouldn't be hard. It would be a tender kind of crust, but she would do that all the time. And my brother and I love that. And then the thing, and I, I can't do it. I never picked up the skill to be able to do that. But the thing that I really remember my paternal grandmother for is cooked apples. 
and I cooked that mm -hmm. for my girl. I love cooked apples. I love cooked apples too. My granny used to make that. So you know I'm Southern, so I got like 15 grandmamas. So my <laughs> granny <laughs> used to make cooked apples. She also now what she was known for, I'm not gonna lie, was grilled cheese sandwich. My granny made the best grilled cheese really? sandwiches. At, like we will all be coming in the house from school. Like, granny, can we have a grilled cheese sandwich? The other thing I thought about too with my uh, paternal grandmother. Not just the pie, she was known for being the woman that always had greens on the stove. Like, yeah. until probably the last, no exaggeration, maybe year of my grandmother's life, there were always, and when it was in season, it was turnips. When it was out of season, it was collard greens. There was mm -hmm. always a pot of collard greens, and there were always cornbread on the stove. No matter, I mean, it was just, it always, always. Mm -hmm. And that sounds a lot like my grandmother because, you know, she, her house was the main house, right? Mm -hmm. Because she's always had, she was the oldest, you know, the oldest girl. So she always had something cooking on the stove. And so people would just come by and it's like at, that at my mom's house today, that people would just come by, grab a plate, eat, socialize, and then leave. But my grandmother was known for these huge meals and I think it's really interesting that at the time that they lived, my mom remembers growing up with these huge meals at times where a lot of African American couldn't, you know, really afford that type of stuff. So, and for breakfast, we ate rice three times a day, being gulch, gulch, um, gulag, 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 I can't even say it, but we ate rice three times a day. We ate rice for breakfast, we ate it for lunch, and we ate it for dinner. For breakfast, we had sugar and butter. Lunch, it was plain. And dinner, you had a gravy. So in addition to the rice, she would make these huge, elaborate breakfasts, you know, a light lunch and then a heavy dinner. So that's what she was known for. Interesting. So when I was growing up, hey, Tom D, we see you here. Um, when I was growing up, I had this interesting experience. So I grew up in South Central Los Angeles and a, uh, along the side of my grandmother's house. So in LA, houses aren't big. There isn't a lot of backyard and things like that. So you have like the small plot. Along the side of my grandmother's house were collard greens. And so I did not grow up with going to the store and getting collard greens. That was an experience I had as an adult. As a child, if you were going to have collard greens, you would go to the side of the house. And my grandmother had, and I don't even know how she was able to grow them like this because I tried to car grow some greens. Mine didn't get these. They were like tallest people. And you'd go and you'd pick the greens from the side of the house. Tallest children? No, well, I don't know because I was a child. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were tall as adults, but I don't know. So that's a yeah. good that's yeah, uh, that's a good point. Right. I, also, mean, I have another question. Memory. I just have a quick question for uh Esty. Was that yes. grilled cheese with the government cheese? Because those oh, that's what my grandma did with the government cheese. <laughs> How dare no. you? How dare you? <laughs> but it was it no, it was with the uh like the chunks of cheddar cheese that you get from the grocery store and so she would intentionally like double stack each side butter both sides of the bread butter in the in the cast iron skillet and i don't know what i could get it close i don't know what granny was on but granny like she so she also made the baked apples and she would do interesting things like we used to put added sugar onto the cereal versus buying frosted flakes. So oh, I was yeah. grown mm -hmm. when I was like, oh, I could just buy it. <laughs> I was yeah. definitely. I think problem. everybody did that. Yeah. Because <laughs> my parents were all, they were the healthy, you know, they were the educated folk who had read books. So they would be like, no, we're going to have whole grain, you know, whatever cereal. But um, they might let me get away with like Fruit Loose or Fruity Pebbles. But my granny would be like, you gonna take this sugar and toss it over these cornflakes. But that's interesting because the the whole part of the narrative too is how you get food, whether or not you could go to the store for a certain mm -hmm. thing. We didn't go to the store for a lot, right? No. Nope. My grandmother, I don't think ever would buy a box of cereal, ever bought a box of cereal. Like that was something she would never have done. 
Same with greens. Like, I don't think she, my mom did, but my grandmother never went. She went down to the country. Whenever you go down to the country, you you, you go get some greens. You go get the stuff that you're going to cook later. You get it out the ground when you go down to the country. Even, like, some, some poultry and some whatever, um, you go down to the country. Like, you don't go to Winn-Dixie, which used to be the big store in um, South Carolina. So, yeah, no, it's, greens were always there. If the man had to come with his truck, your cousin with the greens <laughs> on the back, you would have them. But I don't think we ever bought them out the store. Wait, yeah. did y'all have a watermelon man that would come by your house? Yeah, the watermelon man. In the watermelon, the watermelon truck. Collard greens, corn. And really, it, it, at home, they would just be on the side of the road. But we yeah. kind of knew where they were. So, if yeah, because everybody had gardens. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So it was like if we needed something or something wasn't in season, so maybe the, the you know the green man. That's what we would call him, the green man. <laughs> he always had he had, had huge bunches of collard. Where he would have cabbage. He would have mm. watermelons, beans, all this stuff. So and I don't really remember funny because my mom, you know, um, going back to what she said, Corey, my mom and her siblings always like to recount stories when my grandmother would go home deeper in the country and bring back live chickens. And they said they would have to ride from North Carolina to Virginia with live chickens in the back, hold, <laughs> everybody holding a chicken and no bag. <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't remember anybody coming by our home. My grandfather, for as long as he was physically able, kept a garden in the backyard. Um, but what we didn't have in that garden, we went to the farmer's market to get. And so there was this big, you know, sort of warehouse area where people would drive in with those trucks that you, you talked about. And we would go and pick the things. And I knew if we went to the farmer's market and we got purple hull peas or something, I was on, uh, I was on shelling duty. <laughs> But I liked it. It was, I remember it. I liked shelling duty. I didn't like the pecans because they were a little, you know, they were harder and rougher on the hands. But, you know, per shelling purple hull peas, I just remember that fondly as time with my family, time with my grandmother. Yeah. Yep. Good afternoon, yeah. everyone. If you have just joined us, I, we are here. We jumped in <laughs> without any introduction. My name is Dr. Ife Tayo Ojelade. I'm a licensed psychologist and hang out here in Atlanta in Muskogee territory. And I am talking with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Corey Claiborne, who is a professor of Africana Studies at Morehouse College, Dr. Kendra McRae, who is a professor of history at Atlanta Metropolitan State College, um, my sister, Reverend Esty Nina Dillard, who is also an Arisha priest, and my sister, Professor Nozabelle Waith, who is a anthropology professor and also the owner of Aunt Grand Tressa. And we're going to try to get our sister in here. Sound like she's having some technical difficulties. Sister Tandi, are you here? Uh, sister Tandi Chimaranga, uh, she's our social commentator. Yay! <laughs> I'm obviously not ready for prime time. I apologize. <laughs> That is all right. That is all right. You came just in time because we jumped in because we would start talking about desserts and all kinds of stuff. So we're having this conversation so, today. I'm sorry I'm late. I have no idea where y'all are. So where are you? That's okay. You, okay. That, that is okay. So you, you came right at the uh, right time. So we actually just jumped in and started talking about desserts and what our grandmamas were known for. And, and mm -hmm. just, we, we talked about, it's actually the foundation of what um, High on the Hog was talking about is like looking mm -hmm. at Black food ways, Black culinary history, and the way that that shows up in our families. And I personally think it's an important conversation because when we think about food, it's something that is universal. All of us have to eat it, right? And there has a there's a mental and health impact in terms of food. And when we think about the conversations about food, we can see celebrity chefs and people talk, I mean, we got a whole food network um, in this country, but the face of food in this country and particularly celebrity chefs don't look like us. And I've always thought that that was interesting because I knew that my ancestors during enslavement and after enslavement were cooks, men, men and women. And when I think about the conversation about food, it is often a negative conversation when it comes to black people. 
Yes. So mm-hmm. we're often pathologized and people yeah, yeah. talk about how we're overweight and we have high di- blood pressure and diabetes <laughs> and all these negative things about soul food. And I'm not saying that any of those things, that there isn't that impact, but there's also this positive impact with food. It's the way that- also the connect. corollary, there's also the context in mm-hmm. which we're, we're living, the, in the context in which we have lived and the context in which we're currently living. Like you and I were talking about briefly, you mm-hmm. know, our people grew the food, we knew the animals, we worked with the animals, we worked that land. We was also out there working and walking and doing what, you know, y'all people in the South are famous for, oh, it's just right up the road. Meanwhile, 10 miles later, you ain't got there yet. <laughs> I'm from LA, okay, t- I need to know exactly where it is. Is it 30 miles away or is it around the corner? Stop lying. Y'all suddenly be lying. It's just up the road. No, it ain't. No, it's not. So, Tandy, when you were growing up, did your family grow any food in Los Angeles? My my mother had a garden. My uh, grandparents, my grandmother had a garden. And I was going to say also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about a particular context of our families, one of the things that I heard growing up all the time i didn't understand it but you know as an adult i understand it now my my uh sister would say it my mother would say it um my family my mother's side of the family came from arkansas i didn't get the opportunity to go down south and visit during the summers the way a lot the way my siblings and cousins Mm -hmm. did by the time i was born my grandparents were already out here i had an aunt and two uh, uncles but because my grandparents moved to la the other children, their children who were back uh, back east, they would come out this way to visit their parents. So uh, I miss that land experience. But one of the things that I always heard growing up is, oh, that's a store-bought dress. Or that's some store-bought mm-hmm. milk. That's some store-bought bread or a store-bought cake. And I was like, hmm. And yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't until later I realized, oh, y'all made everything at home. Mm-hmm. You milked the cows. That's why this is store-bought milk. You made your own biscuits. You made your own cake. That's why this is store-bought. And I had seamstresses in my family also. I know that has nothing to do with food, but that's why they say store-bought dress. But always heard store-bought. It's like, hmm. And of course, you know, the ice box. You know, my family literally remembers when you had to get ice and put it in a box Mm -hmm. to to, to keep everything cold. Uh, To this day, my mother would call it uh, call it the ice box. Mm-hmm. And not a refrigerator. We've been we've been whirlpooling all up and you know all up and for decades. It's an icebox. Okay, all right, mama. Uh, but yeah, but the context in which we were eating and living and working, even though white supremacy is terrorism, even though white supremacy is stress, you know the fact that we would work those plots of land and have little gardens, even during enslavement, was a, a, a teeny tiny uh, effort at self determination, determining our own food, knowing that we couldn't get enough food from Massa, that we was going to get scraps, we would supplement. So yeah, uh, understanding the context uh, is also key. And the last, the other thing I wanted to mention too, many of us are familiar with the Yoruba or Ifa tradition. Mm. You know, what I appreciated about High on the Hog was the loving way it was presented. And it was, Mm. I thought, a very, very holistic way in terms of our culture. I know some people are probably still wondering what the whole uh, Benin enslavement aspect had to do. But uh, for those of us who are familiar with uh, your tradition in particular, you know, when you have naming ceremonies or when you have rites of passage ceremonies, when you have the, what we call the eight or the nine bowl ceremonies, you know, and when you look at the offerings that are made in this tradition, this spiritual tradition, which some people call a religion, there are staples such as palm oil, that is a staple of Nigerian or Yoruba or West African food. You know, fufu, akara, mm. a lot of the different uh, egusi soup, a lot of the different dishes are staple offerings that we make to the divinities, to the divine. And I know that my teacher who lived there, uh, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Ife Tayo Baba Medahochi. Yes. Baba Medahochi once said that religion is the deification of one's nationalism. Our experiences, our culture is sacred. And that doesn't mean that you leave the food out. That doesn't mean that you leave the food out, which is why when we, we, which is why we still pour libation. It might not be palm wine, it might be Thunderbird or Night Train, 
but it, you know, it might be some old English this time. I don't know, <laughs> but it might be some Henny. I don't know if people want to waste Henny and Patron, but I, they call it, they might feel they're wasting it, but whatever has become a staple is sacred to us. This yeah. is what nourishes us and feeds us on a daily. It would make sense to consider it to be sacred and to give thanks and to incorporate it. So let's open this up. So Tani, that was actually a good kind of segue because we were just talking about our own family. And let's, I want to open this discussion up for us to talk about High on the Hog because I know that we all saw it. And I'm just wondering just overall, like what's your first reaction when you think about the docuseries? And that's for anybody. I was excited when I first saw it because it was a conversation that we had been having in history, particularly public history, for a very long time in terms of food traditions, African-American food traditions, and, and in particular, two aspects of those food traditions. One, the way they're rooted in our African heritage, and there are some of the ways that our ancestral heritage has been held over in our culture, and two, the way our culture, our innovations, and our traditions contributed to the development of the United States and continue to contribute to the development of the United States. So I was really excited about, as uh, Tandi says, the loving way that was presented on screen. I mean, other than tears being my primary reaction, because <laughs> that was my primary reaction. I I really appreciated more than just the food waste conversation, the way that it felt like gentle space was held for us telling our own stories from our own locations. Um, and I and I don't know that there's enough of that. I think that there is a lot of um, trying to figure out how to be in conversation with the realities of what it is to be African in America. Um, and, and I think some come from genuine places and then you have stuff like Django, right? Which is asinine. So, you know, so I, I, I think of the things that I've experienced, this felt very much so like it was gentle, like it was loving, like it was intentional. And it was important to me the way that they were intentional about making sure that we were seen as a part of American history, but still separate and apart from that. Um, and, and while holding both things in tension in a way that felt honest and that felt um, that felt truthful and authentic to my own experience. Um, so I, I, I thought it was really, really just well done. Yeah. And to kind of veggie back on what Essia said, I think it was like a love letter to African-American culture and African-American food. And it was very, very beautifully done. It made you fall in love with the culture again, because a lot of times we take things for granted, right? Uh, a lot of times, um, some of us can forget the impact that our cuisine has had on American culture. Sometimes we can forget the uniqueness in terms of the food, not only the food that we cook, but the way that we prepare the food, right? The way that we serve the food, the way that we consume the food, which is all encompasses what a food way is. You know, we take it for granted that we're going to have that coconut cake on Easter, you know? So it, it brought all those things back to let me fall in love with Afri you know, African-American food and culture all over again. So I appreciated that about the doc. Yeah, and I was going to say one of the things that it, I'd always realized, but I think it made manifest in that documentary, is that remembering is powerful. It is a tool of resistance and liberation, right? Like that, you know, and oftentimes I hear a lot of people talk about this, and maybe it is partly sexism because they assume when you talk about food or something like quilting or whatever, it's the domain of women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it becomes less like people are fighting back. Um, but it is the thing that literally kept us alive, right? Like I think about, you know, even after like the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina, which is in the 1700s, where they outlawed dancing and gathering in groups and speaking your African language. One of the things that they outlawed too was growing your own food. Like they used to say, they didn't feed you. I think that's the big myth that, you know, master provided you with the scraps from their table. It's like, no, you got to figure out how to have your old food. You have to grow it. 
And so there was a period, and so there would be periods where they, they cracked down on this, right? Where they said, okay, you know what? You, you have to stop growing on your own food because they realized it was giving them too much strength. They were not dependent on white people, that they could like literally have barter and trade amongst themselves, that people could hire themselves out to do certain things. So they were like, you can't do this either. But the fact that they still did it and, and continued to um, commit to rem keeping their food ways alive, even if the master said that they couldn't do it, I think says a lot uh, about how important our food was to us. When I looked at the documentary, okay, so first of all, like Esty, I mean, I cried each episode. So there were times where I just had to stop and I had to take it in. I mean, it was, and it was good tears because it was so beautiful. And to me, it, I saw it right after we did that last conversation on black trauma porn. And I thought it was really interesting because I thought it was a beautiful example of how to tell our story, but not make it in this salacious pornographic way where people can basically suck the life out of us. So it told the story and it beautifully sequenced stuff. So I could tell that they must have uh, consulted with a historian or someone because of the way that each a series, each part in the series was sequenced. And it was very authentic and it it held space for us in a way that I thought was really just beautiful. Um, what was surprised you in the documentary? I mean, I was surprised by tons of stuff, but I'm wondering like what stood out where there was something like you were like, oh, I didn't realize that. For me, I, I, I knew a lot of the information. I, I just was appreciative that it was shown in the in a venue like Netflix, in particular, since I had been looking at other food shows and shows about chefs, and often the African and African American influences on American cuisine are sidelined mm -hmm. at best. Mm -hmm. But what was surprising was the historical information about say the origins of mac and cheese in presidential, you know, enslaved um, cooks within the presidential um, household and things like that. I didn't know about that. And I really liked that part. I'm from Virginia, y'all. Macaroni and cheese started in my backyard. <laughs> and the, the really weird thing, when I watched that segment, I thought, um, of a couple of things. I remember how we had to go to Monticello when we were younger. That was that was like a mandatory field trip that we took in, you know, every other grade. We would have to go to the home of Thomas Jefferson. And I remember as a child looking at it, they would talk about these beautiful plantation homes and then basically, and over there is that's where the slaves lived. So that was, you know, really, really um, traumatizing. But there is an African-American archaeology that started in the, um, I think it was like the late 60s, that they started to shift the focus from plantation homes to actually look at the spaces and places where enslaved people lived. And we start learning a lot about that. And when we watched that episode, when I watched that episode of Founding Fathers, um, Dr. McCray, I thought about you because remember you used to work at the Atlanta History Center when we were in college. And whenever they taught you a new technique, you would give them to us as Kwanzaa gifts. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's what I liked about that as well. That's funny. So I think uh, for me, uh, much of the information I knew too. Um, so outside of what's already been mentioned, what was a good reminder is how much we have recreated the same things. So I love watching the plates, right? So when they would be in all these different places and I have mm -hmm. to look at the plate and be like, I don't know what that actually is because they didn't describe every single thing, but that looked like this, that looked like that, that looked like this, that my auntie used So, So the familiarity of how black genius still took what they had in a different culture with different soil with different materials with different crops but recreated a version mm -hmm. of what was ancestral and indigenous to us in a different place was a really powerful theme that i saw throughout the series mm -hmm. 
And I'll say I knew this, but I appreciated this, the, the role of men in cooking, especially um, uh, like, you know, being from coastal South Carolina. I mean, one of the things that you know is like, for example, the men make the nets that they catch the crab in. They, they go get the oysters, which are, you know, it's not. Well, it is kind of dangerous work, right? Like they do the fish and then they have the fish fry. So there was always that, you know, that that was kind of the world of men. Even today, my uncles cook the fish. The, you know, if it is any kind of seafood to be had, they go procure it and make it if it was a, a crab boil or whatever. That has always been maintained. And I think that that is something too, because we always think, oh, well, this is the, the role of women, but men from literally making a boat <laughs> then making the net <laughs> and getting the fish and the, the shrimp and the whatever and then making it right was like a huge part of our history that I think we don't talk enough about and making the baskets like a lot of the seagrass baskets that you see most people only think about them uh, as women weavers mm -hmm. but men because they were for utility made like especially early on most of the baskets that you know we would see and they would throw them away when they you know got used. Uh, nowadays, we can't think of that because they're all worth thousands of dollars, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Tandy, yeah, what about I, you? I appreciated that also, yeah. Uh, seeing the involvement of men in cooking on so many levels, I really did appreciate that. The other thing that I, I think it was new for me, you know, I'm having memory challenges, but uh, just hearing about how, uh, I believe it was Jefferson and Washington, I know it was one of Washington's uh, chefs, learned or, or went to France was actually able to, to, to get the uh, to get that knowledge and bring those dishes back which added to mm -hmm. his repertoire and then he was like you know what deuces I'm out and go and make a living for himself and the funny thing I thought it was hilarious people in New York be like George we seen such and such over here on 83rd street you know, there were <laughs> sightings of these people oh that they would send back to George Washington or to Thomas Jefferson and then the brother get ghost again and go someplace else with his talents and be able to sustain himself or his family. I thought that was hilarious. And Dr. McCray, I, I mean, so I always think about this. So when when I heard that part about Thomas Jefferson, because I forget the brother's name, but I, when I heard his last name was Hemmings, I was thinking, huh, I wonder if he's related to Sal Sally Hemmings. And then sure enough, that's Sally Hemmings' brother. And what they didn't say in the documentary, but then I put together is like, okay, so Sally Hemings was Thomas Jefferson's technically in, in real life terms, his sister-in-law. And so yes. that was his brother-in-law that he was enslaved. Yes. So he was having sex and producing children and raping his sister-in-law and then enslaving his brother-in-law and having him um, cook for him. Am yeah. I remembering that correctly in terms yes. of lineage? Okay. Yeah, that um, S Sally Hemings' father was the same father as Martha, I think her name is, Jefferson. Yeah, his wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, one thing that I wasn't clear on when they talked about someone was given their freedom if they trained the other one to take his place. That was him. That was him. Yeah, so quote unquote, he trained his brother to take his place. The way that it was presented, I'm wondering, was it actually, did he actually, quote unquote, leave his brother in enslavement? Or is there another way that could have actually been like, I'm going to get free and I'm going to send for you. I'm going to make a way for you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there was a nuance there that may have been missed. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think I just took it as well. We asked let's, the historian. You got some information on that? <laughs> no, I don't know this story well enough to say whether there is a nuance there. I mean, it's always possible, but I mean, there. If you read, has anybody read "Never Caught" about on a judge who ran away from George Washington? So that's a good book to read, and you'll get some ideas about family ties and how family ties might have cemented a person um, in place so that they were reluctant to run away from enslavement and the agony that someone might have gone through if they saw an opportunity but couldn't take the whole family to get away and in if they you know pined for their family and were trying to figure out a way to get 
the family free, but they just didn't have the bandwidth because they were trying to remain free themselves, as Tandy said, because people would be like, ah, George, I saw on a, on 54th Street when I was in New York or what have you, you know. Um, so that could give us more clues. I would have to do specific research on that topic to be able to weigh in with any, any you know, heft. And, you but know, always the, the literature person can probably <laughs> um, give us something. To- <laughs> no, I was just going to say about the Hemings. Um, we had a discussion about this in American Lit because they were talking about the time when Thomas Jefferson took uh, Sally and her brother to France uh, while he was there. Cause you know, he's this big Francophile. Well, you, if you saw Hamilton, you kind of know that mm-hmm. too. And, um, but what is interesting is that all my students were like, why didn't they just stay in France? They could have been free. They would have been, you know, minding their business. Like people treated them certain kind of ways. They could have just stayed there. And what, I understood from that, I mean, of course, Sally Hemings didn't write any kind of narrative. We don't know it from that. There have been a lot that's written about her, right? Um, Annette Gordon-Reed and then, uh, what's her name? Barbara Chase Rabeau did a, a novel. But it becomes interesting because what it seems like is that Sally, you know, she doesn't speak French either, but she was like, we need to go back home because our whole family is there, right? Like, we can't, we can't just leave and be out in slavery. It's almost like she's the one uh, that convinces him to go back. Uh, And this is before she has all the kids by Jefferson, right? Convinces him to go back because it won't be a uh, sort of, uh, they won't really be free in France, even though they're quote unquote free. So I think there is a moment where and the Sally's never freed, right? Like Jefferson makes after he dies. So uh, the brother, you know, becomes a chef and leaves. This is after Jefferson dies and he leaves all of his, their their brothers and sisters to his child, his white children. And um, they do set some of them free. Uh, Sally Hemings is never set free. Like she, you know, they said they give her a nice apartment on the side. If you've been to Monticello, I think you can yeah, see like, you know, where she lived, right? Like as if, ooh, she done made it. Right, like she's not free, but she could get live in the good part. Um, And there's even pictures of his half black daughter. You can sort of Google it. Like there's a painting done of her. But um, I think that what Jane, what you know, finally he decides to leave because he realizes the part of the Hemings that are going to be there, they're not ever going to leave. Right? Like I think that that is if there is a moment where they sort of break off um, after Jefferson dies, it's because I think that they realize the family that's going to be there is just going to be there. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because everyone can be Harriet Tubman. You know what I mean? As that, that is a very difficult thing to do. And, and I know we touched on some of her. Um, uh, we touched on Harriet Tubman a while back. And the thing that I think is interesting about Thomas Jefferson, like you were saying, Corey, the actual plantation was segregated. And you had these spaces where the Thomas Jefferson's favorites lived, which was closer to the big house. And then you have where everybody else lived. And there's archeological evidence that showed that it created a disparity amongst those people because of the things that they ate. So you can go, they have what was called these um, indoor storage spots where the enslaved people would dig holes in the cabins and they would put all the pilfered goods in there. So they would hide the food that they took from the big house. They would hide China and all of these things. So at Mulberry Row over on at Thomas Jefferson's place, you you get to see this. You get to see some of the cups that were hidden. You get to Mm -hmm. see the bones um, that's left over from the meat that was cut in a different Um, the same way that they cut in the big house, right? And then you would look at the ones that were a little far off. And the people who stay far further away from the big house, their diets were very, very poor. You know, Mm -hmm. archaeological evidence said that they had a shorter lifespan, you know, that they couldn't produce as many, they had a harder time. So those types of things are interesting. And they said in a documentary how Thomas Jefferson was really, really meticulous about all of the things that he ordered. So, you know, with the record, so we kind of knew what they ate, how they ate it, and how favoritism can kind of like, and colorism created those divisions 
in those living spaces. And I, I want to kind of shift us, like move us along to the second, because um, this is, no, I think that you guys are talking about the third one. But in this in the second part of the documentary series, we see the sister that's on the land. And I, I, I hate that I don't remember her name or Sally Hemings' brother's name. So I need to pull those names up because I want us to give voice to those names. But the sister that was living in New York and goes back to North Carolina and is on her family's land and growing food and, and learning from her ancestors. And I think that that is a, a really powerful statement about the ways in which some ways that we've moved away from food kind of goes to Tandi, your your conversation about stuff being store-bought. I know growing up, store-bought stuff was considered better than if it was homemade or, you know, if you could go to the store and, and buy groceries as opposed to getting stuff out of the garden. And now we kind of see this renaissance where things are moving back to the this ability to be able to feed ourselves. And the thing that really got me, I don't know about y'all, but was when they cooked that whole hog and they made their own charcoal. They had them little grates. They didn't go to Home Depot and buy them no, or Costco and buy them a barbecue pit. They cooked the whole hog for the entire community. Now, I don't know about you, but me, I don't eat hog. But I was like... But wasn't nothing stole bought, though. But wasn't nothing And stole I thought that was powerful. Because Angelina and I said, so, okay, if the revolution go down tomorrow, what we going to do? We going to cook everybody some mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, um, they cook a whole hogs at my grandmama's <laughs> property in Alabama every 4th of July. So it just happened last week. It's literally called the hog killing and it is happening right now. Like my family still does it. And it used to be for our family in particular because our family's huge but now it, it's a community thing and people have spade tournaments and you know, so now they cook more than one hog and it's the whole thing. But it's, it, yeah, I mean, the revolution happened. We can go to uh, Sunflower, Alabama, <laughs> McIntosh, Alabama, and we'll be just fine. <laughs> just well fed. <laughs> Have refuge. We got land, property, houses. <laughs> we got to take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm not eating the hog, right. <laughs> but it's plenty of chickens. <laughs> but that's the thing. I don't think you have to eat it, right? Like, because I remember my great grandparents down in Effingham, South Carolina. They always had hogs. We made hogs. I remember like a family in down to the country, as I said, and they would do that whole dig up a pit, make a hog. But most people didn't eat it. I don't know if it's because they had high blood pressure. I don't know what it was, right? Like, I think that that was sort of, like, this is what we do in community. This is what we do as part of the community. But it doesn't necessarily mean that um, that's what we're going to eat. And even in general, I think that most of my, you know, great-grandparents, like, I remember them very well. Like, they didn't eat a lot of meat in, in general, even though they had chickens. And hogs and whatever it was like a every big celebration like it would have to be fourth of july right before they would eat ham or christmas or whatever it wasn't like okay it's monday so what i'm about to do is have this bacon for breakfast then i'm about to have this chicken out of picked up out the yard then i'm gonna have all this you know they they didn't do that. It was rice. <laughs> it was grits. Maybe they would have fish. Maybe, but I always remember a lot of vegetables. It was things that if if you had meat, it was like you had it again, right? We have something that's very regional to a certain part of the Gullah Coast. It's not even the whole thing, which is called chicken perlo or prelo, depending on how you pronounce it. But it's like you take something, and it, anything could be a perlo. So turkey, chicken, shrimp, whatever. It's like you had it one day in a big celebration. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you have a whole pot of rice and then you uh, kind of put onions and all these spices and put the chicken in there. And then you make what you call a perlo, a chicken perlo, a chicken bog, people call it too. And then you would literally have that for whenever. But you wouldn't have that again because you it was off of the leftovers of a big meal but then you wouldn't sort of think that you were gonna have that every day. Like you couldn't just go ask your mama to go make some chicken bog. Like, no, it'd be like, 
Did we have this big meal? Did we have a big, did we have a big pig? Do we have leftover stuff that we can then go put in this pot of rice? Okay, then you're gonna have it, right? But it's not something that, you know, I think that that's one of our biggest health concerns, why we think, you know, that our ancestors meant we were supposed to eat like this heavy stuff every single day when they did not do that. Yeah. I think um, too, my, were, oh. Oh, I was gonna just say, I thought you would ask um, a, a, a question, Dr. O.J. Lade, about future episodes, how we would envision future episodes. And I was going to talk about this at that point, but <laughs> th it fits here. Um, I think what we're missing in the conversation, what was missing in High on the Hog was a, a walking us through of A, how the food ways, the food traditions, African-American food traditions were labeled soul food in what context? Because that, I think now we take for granted that it was always called soul food, but that was a particular naming that came out of the black power movement, civil, late civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. The other, so with that naming came some other conceptions about what black food ways were and what they should be. And some discussions about how much of the food ways how, uh, uh, is shaped by slavery, enslavement, and limitation, uh, limitations on our traditional ways of eating. And in that discussion, we can't discount the Nation of Islam and other Black nationalist food ways and the circulation of how to eat to live. And I think some of by the time we get to the 1990s, when we're adults and we're in, in control of our food ways, I know I'm going to tell an anecdotal story. I had other people who are black nationalist minded who are like, oh, sister, you eat pork, take the uh, pork off your plate. This is what's causing your grandparents to have all this high blood pressure and all these pro health problems that they're having. And it really affected me. I used to have nightmares about it. And so the transition for to vegetarianism and then veganism wasn't difficult for me. But the bottom line was I still gain weight exponentially on a vegetarian diet because like what we're saying, a lot of it is portion control, how much you move, how much you're sedentary. Right. Um, calories in, calories out. And so if I you know, if I have a small pork cutlet and some greens, is it going to make a difference in my diet or, you know, am I going to have this big bowl of split pea soup and this big piece of um, cornbread and yams and, you know, then go sit down and write about it, which is what I was doing. So I think what could happen more, I think what will extend the conversation is when we talk about the overlap of Black nationalist food ways with our traditional food ways that we got from African Americans and then the African food ways influence together. And I, I saw somebody gave me the, the name. So James Hemming. So I just want to lift that brother's name up as an ancestor in um, Black culinary traditions. I think what you were saying is significant because one of the memories I have, and it makes me tearful um, every time I think about it, was I remember, remember I told you on both sides, my grandmothers were cooks. And so my maternal grandmother, my brother and I had gone to her house and she had cooked a big Thanksgiving dinner. And um, my brother and I, young, I'm probably 19, 20 at the time, you know, super pro-Black, getting into all the Black nationalism. And my grandmother cooked greens that had meat in them. And my brother and I were like, oh, we don't eat the pork or whatever. And it was so insulting to my grandmother. Um, and I'm embarrassed, uh, honestly, that I did that. And I think about the importance. I mean, my grandmother poured so much love into food and that was one of her clear ways of showing that she loved her family. And for me and my brother to turn up our nose, like, oh, we can't eat that kind of stuff. That little pork, I'm 19 years old, running around LA all the time, that eating all those greens with that pork and it was not going to end my life. And I think that that's one of the things that I've learned you know, 20 plus years later is to not be so dogmatic about food in ways that disconnect us. Like hearing these kind of white supremacist ideas of like your food is unhealthy and terrible and it's going to kill you to the point where it sets up hostility with my family. That's not black nationalism. 
And it's not loving at all, definitely. No. But you know, the other thing that I wanted to uh, just pause it, just drop it into the conversation uh, because I think it should be acknowledged and we can talk about it more in depth later. I talked about uh, the Yoruba tradition earlier. You know, there's a spiritual aspect. We are an African people. We are a spiritual people, whether we uh, believe that or not, whether we believe spirit is real, whether we acknowledge it or not. Our ancestors, it's an abundance of information that shows how our ancestors felt about spirit. And one of the things that uh, I don't think we talk about enough is taboos, food taboos. Food taboos are mm -hmm. a serious part of African traditional culture. And some of that we carried with us. And some of that, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, to, to a Western trained eye, it might just be a, a fluke, but some of us can see how a person may be affected if they're eating something they should not be eating. Like there could be a spiritual reason for that. There could be a spiritual um, agreement that was broken that mm -hmm. affects uh, a person today. For example, I know my brother has a, uh, like some people have a, you know, this aversion, this, uh, what's, the, what's the word? You have to forgive me, I'm having short-term memory loss. Uh, allergic to seafood allergy. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, now for some people, it, I don't know why it could be that way, but for some other people, it could be that an agreement was made long ago that you will not eat or your lineage will not touch this or your lineage will honor the sea and your consuming of that which came from the sea is breaking an agreement or the reason you're having trouble in your life is because you're consuming something that is not good for your lineage. So, you know, those are interesting things that I'm, I'm finding out about now. Uh, of course, the majority of black folk are gonna be like, get out of here with that. But I think it's an area, it's an area deserving of study and uh, of at least inclusion in, in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And Esty, I see you want to say something about that. I want to pull um, uh, Nosabella in on that too, from an anthropological, pers anthropological perspective. So what Sister Tandy is talking about is like from a spiritual tradition, whether it be in Ifa or Khan, it can be in Vodun and African spiritual traditions, oftentimes people have spiritual taboos. So there's messages that come from spirit that tell people things that they should eat, um, but then there's also messages that tell people um, things that they can avoid. So I'd be hurting because one of my taboos is um, is uh, uh, I can't eat. What's the bread that the Ethiopians eat? And I love that stuff. Nah, and Jira. 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 Man, Jira. man, 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 man. That, so that hurt. Oh. Uh, real quick, too, I wanted to mention... Uh, yeah, I wanted to mention it and now it's gone. So I'll, ju I'll jump back in on that later. Okay. Esther, go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, I actually was thinking about my comment that I was going to make earlier. It relates to what um, Tandy was saying. Because for for me, what I wanted to raise is it, it's really about relationship. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a relationship that we have as African folks to creation. Um, and so I, I thought about um, needing to name that when um, Pro Professor Claiborne, Dr. Claiborne was talking about, you know, like how we consume the food and how we consume the meat in particular, because watching my grandmother raise chicken, she had a relationship to those chickens. So she <laughs> wasn't going to kill them. You know what I mean? Like, in fact, my grandma will fight you. My, I've seen my grandmother kill other animals because they weren't finna with her chickens. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you ain't mess with none my grandmama raised. None of us. Humans, chickens, vegetables, garden, pecans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, they, you weren't coming in her yard. Um, so, so uh, you know, if you know me, that's my namesake. So, <laughs> that we don't want, you know, uh-uh. And so, I, it, but it was because there's a relationship there. And, and also how you see it as a resource. You know what I'm saying? Like with the with the hog, with my family. Now we did eat pork. I was the weird one. Um, but I, I will say too, it was, there was a utility for all of it. So you were going to make hog head cheese, which we saw in a documentary. Mm -hmm. There was going to be soups made. There was going to be fat back made. There was going to be pork belly cut. There was going to be certain cuts of meat that were going to be saved. And so there was a way that we also had a utility from the ruler to the tuna. 
um, where even skin and all of that was consumed and used. And so then you could eat off that one hog for months at a time because mm -hmm. of how we were in relationship to it. And so for me, that very much so is ancestral, that's spiritual as well, because part of what I think has been lost is our spiritual relationship to how we eat and why we eat and why we consume what we consume and the utility that it has, not just for our bodies and for our sustenance, but for our spiritual ability to maintain ourselves and have a resource. Right, and okay. Go ahead. Real quick before I forget, and one of the word I was thinking about was epigenetics. Mm -hmm. so when we talk about epigenetics, we can we should look also look at our relationship to food and how it has changed over time, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how we relate to it individually, how it relates to our DNA, how it relates to our not just our psychic makeup but our bodies, in terms of the diet that we were used to, and then we get over here and the the predominant diet of the land. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. We're right at one o'clock. Nozabella, I'm going to let you go. And then um, Dr. McCray, I know you're going to share the, you can close out by sharing the clip with your cousin and give us some context around that. Okay. I think um, to go along with what um, Tandi said and Esty is that African people, especially in the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Voodoo, um, the Akan tradition, realize the importance of the life force, the Ashe, the Ashe that lives in animals, the Ashe that lives in plants, and the Ashe that lives in us. So when we killed an animal, when we harvest, harvested vegetables, when we did any of those things, we understood that it was a special relationship that we had with the life force that was a part of God right? So when we killed the chicken or when we did that, it was with the understanding that not only will we nourish our spiritual body, but we will also nourish our spiritual body, our communal body, our family body, all of these things that was tied into cooking. And a lot of times people, they kind of assumed that slavery had just cut us off from African culture. And that's not, that's not true at all, because Sterling Stuckey talks all the time about African-American cultural continuities. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier about the indoor storage pots, when they did archaeological evidence, they tied that back to the Igbo people in Nigeria, that mm -hmm. they used these indoor, you know, um, they would dig holes by their doors and they would put implements of certain voodoo or Arisha in by the doors to protect their, to protect their houses. They would put, um, a lack of a better term, grigri in those holes. So the same holes and the same type of indoor storage spot um, pots that you would see in Nigeria, you can look at some of the enslaved quarters and see the same things that they took the food that they ate and they took a portion of that food and they laid it out for their ancestors as a sacrifice, still continuing along with the ashe and, you know, um, eating the food that's good for you, knowing that this person should eat this and not that, you know, it will still continue. Yeah. Dr. McCray. So, okay, l l let me set this up just a little bit. So part of what uh, we talked about being able to do with this series is to interview people that are in our family. And so we'll have a part two of this. And this is gonna be like a little teaser. So Dr. McCray interviews somebody in her family about their food ways coming from Alabama. So you wanna um, talk a little bit about that and then show the clip? Sure. Um, so I interviewed my cousin, David. Um, he is David Watkins. He is my uh, paternal on my paternal side, my cousin on my paternal side. So his his grandmother is my grandmother's sister. I don't know which cousin that makes him third. <laughs> second, um, yeah, that third. Second I think. No, his. So our. So his grandmother's my great aunt. So um, he is a trained chef, and he has a business called David's Decadent Delights, and he is expanding his business to into finger licking eats. But we talked, we chatted a long time, and. Um, we have an interesting relationship to, to food traditions in our family, and he carries those food traditions on in a lot of ways. He had a restaurant before COVID, and he named it after uh, his grandmother, my great aunt, and his paternal grandmother, uh, Pearl. Um, and he talks, he's here in this clip discussing what he decided to 
put into the restaurant and what he decided to leave out and all kinds of things. And he's not the only one. Our, we have a legend in our family that our patriarch uh, on our uh, maternal side, Henry Lyles, actually built Homewood Church of God, which is still in existence today, based on, uh, a lot, in large part, sales of his wonderful barbecue. And that recipe is in our family. Uh, there's a business my cousins have set up in Birmingham called Roadside Barbecue, but that's a different set of cousins. So here you're going to hear from How my cousin the David. You got from your grandmothers. So of course, being from Birmingham, you know, soul food is the thing. So my thing was we were doing a soul food buffet. Um, of course, when I first started, we was just doing pop ups, so we were just serving different meals. So of course, the mac and cheese, collard greens, fish fried fried chicken, pork chops, all the good stuff that we're accustomed to growing up. Sunday dinner, basically, what you got every day of the week. Um, so my thing was, I always tried to be better um, than my grandparents or better than, you know, anybody. You you provide me the foundation. My thing is to perfect it. That was my whole thing. So um, I got my, let's see, my grandma used to cook green beans every Sunday. Like that was her thing. And I hated green beans growing up because we ate them all the time. So I had to figure out a way to make myself like green beans again. So I just had to tweak the different recipes. And, you know, pot roast was another thing that she always cooked on Sundays, uh, smothered pork chops. So it was just taking the things that I grew up on on Sundays, every Sunday, because we had Sunday dinner every Sunday. Um, well, believe it or not, we had dinner with her every day because she cooked every day of the week, except Saturday and Sunday. That was the only day that she didn't cook. Um, so we were familiar with food that was going to keep you full. Like I'm not the prior type of person that goes to fast food restaurants, McDonald's, because that doesn't really sustain me. I'm the type of person I have to have a full meal and people don't understand that. But I that's what I grew up on. Three meals a day and they were hearty meals. So that was my thing, making sure people had comfort food that they were accustomed to or brought them memories of back home. Uh-oh. That was just a sneak peek. So I'm excited to, for us to all come in and share and talk. And he had more to say, and we'll I'll just leave it at that for this week. Okay. Thank you. So for those that are listening, hopefully if you haven't seen High on the Hall yet, you will uh, have a chance to see it. It is an excellent docuseries. Again, it is on Netflix. I saw one. I missed this comment. Uh, Alethea said in the Caribbean, Corey, that chicken perlu, they call it chicken pilau, I think, in the Caribbean. And so you see those connections again. Exactly. I think like I always say, you know, South Carolina is a colony of Barbados. So a lot of times <laughs> it'll be like, so we just picked up, they just literally brought it straight over. So the, the, the pronunciation of the thing might have changed, but it is the same uh, name. You can see these connections everywhere. So everyone do me a favor. If this conversation was something that was impactful to you, then do me a favor, give it a like, give it a thumbs up. Um, you can also share this with uh, folks in the YouTube world, you know, I mean, the YouTube, I'm saying YouTube, the YouTube and the Facebook world, there are all kinds of algorithms. And so what makes a difference for us is you just being able to share this video and making a comment or liking it. That's what allows other people to be able to see it. So take care.